Hi, welcome to our training on social emotional learning and equity hosted by Partnership for Success in partnership with our Learning Extension Center community. Uh, before we jump in, we just want to remind everybody that it's really important to care for ourselves. We want to prioritize self-care even when it feels like we can't. It's important um, so that we can care for others. Um, so just be intentional about doing things that bring you joy. I know we all have so much going on. There's virtual school, working from home, maybe not working from home, balancing family, trying to be productive at work, and just trying to hold it all together. Try to remember to take some time for yourselves. Uh, and just a friendly reminder that doing your best does not mean depleting yourself. If you can find 10 minutes, 30 minutes here and there for you, uh, I think that will help, you know, help all of us sustain ourselves. Go for a walk, take a, you know, hot bath, read a book, something that will refresh your soul. I just want to encourage us all to do that. Uh, we want to highlight social emotional learning as a tool to promote equity and also share strategies that promote equity within each of the social emotional learning competencies. So let's talk about equity. We always want to promote equity when we are working with our students, especially when we're working with social emotional learning. We're going to provide high quality instruction and support to youth regardless of their backgrounds. That is what equity in a nutshell is. We'll spend a few minutes talking about equity, then we'll dive into some strategies to promote it. Uh, first, let's talk about what equity is not. Equity is not equality. It's not giving everybody the same thing. Equality is actually presumptuous. Equality only works if everyone is starting from the exact same place and has the exact same resources. Equality in this picture that you see on the top left shows that each child has the same resources and they're all on level ground. That's not reality. We know that we have systemic injustice that prevents youth from being on level ground. Therefore, equality is not a, an approach that will work. Equity, if you look at that top right picture, equity is acknowledging that different people have different circumstances and different lived experiences. Providing educational equity means that students have access to the right resources at the right time with no regard to race, ethnicity, language, disability, gender, etc. Equity not acknowledges that the system is unjust. That's represented by the unlevel ground in that, that picture. And equity gives each person the resources that they need. So if they needed one, two, or three boxes, they were given what they needed at that time for that outcome. The goal is to get resources to youth and to reduce barriers represented in the opportunity picture where we've removed the fence altogether. We also wanna ensure that opportunity is presented in a way that promotes agency. Agencies is represented in that picture by one of the, the youth who moved forward to participate in the game. That's our ultimate goal. Again, this training, we're focusing on equity. I like this quote here. I think it's a, a really good one. Um, Castle, the collaborator for academic social and emotional learning, notes that striving for educational equity challenges us to examine biases and interrupt inequitable practices so that we can create inclusive, multicultural school environments that cultivate the interests and talents of children, youth, and adults from diverse backgrounds. That's what transformative SEL is. It's the process of students and teachers building strong, respectful relationships that are rooted in an appreciation of similarities and differences. If we wanna truly, truly impact the lives of our students, of our young people and equip them with tools for life, we absolutely have to promote equity. If we don't, we're simply asking our students to fit an existing mold. Why would we wanna do that? We don't want them to fit in a, a preconceived mold. They're actually creating new molds altogether. Uh, so we, we wanna you know, promote equity. Uh, there's an old saying that says, students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Committing to promote equity and committing to disrupt inequitable systems demonstrates our care. It's through this practice we can truly build genuine relationships with youth and have positive impact. It starts with us. We say that over and over again, and we will continue to say it. It starts with us as adult learners and leaders in the room. We cannot lead students where we will not or have not gone. So here's some questions uh, as you think through and plan activities to, to help you think with that. Uh, in, in that mindset. So we'll just go through this slide here. It just says we can grow and deepen our own practice by reflecting on some questions. Here are some good examples. So before you plan and implement activities, you might ask yourself, you know, what beliefs do I hold about my students that may be impacting my instruction or even the way that I'm designing instruction? How do they hinder my students? 
or myself, or how do they help my students or myself? Another one, how can this lesson affirm the identities of the students in my class? Again, that's a huge part of equity, affirming students and their identities. How does this lesson support that? Am I incorporating a counter narrative? Am I representing the viewpoint of a population who is marginalized? Also, how will I strengthen my relationship with my students or their relationships with one another through this lesson? What actions can I take to ensure that I'm being intentional about relationship building? And finally, how will I practice self-management and be transparent about how I'm practicing it during this lesson? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about modeling later on in the training, but really important for us to practice self-management and you know, to let the, the students in on that process. So we're going to dive into the competencies uh, that SEL breaks down into, and we're going to talk about how each of them uh, can be used as a tool to promote equity. And again, what we're looking for is for us to celebrate diversity. We're looking to affirm students' identities, backgrounds, race, class, gender, and what makes them who they are. Just a quick reminder, these are the competencies that uh, Aperture breaks SEL into. And so CASEL, you'll see, breaks them into five competencies. Um, when we use the DESA system, it takes those exact same five competencies and just breaks them down a little bit further into the eight that you see on the screen. We're going to go through each of those together. Self-awareness is where we're going to start. Self-awareness is honestly, it's the foundation of social emotional learning. We have to learn to recognize our emotions, our thoughts, as well as our values. And, you know, how do they influence our behavior? What are our strengths? What limitations are we working with? Are we growing in confidence? Are we growing in optimism? Are we maintaining that growth mindset? These things all uh, are, are incorporated into self-awareness. We first must learn to manage ourselves so we can build positive relationships with others so that we can learn to build empathy for others, set and work toward goals, make responsible decisions. Lots of things come back to self-awareness. And in the United States, there's research to demonstrate that our cultural norms that promote individualism and materialism, that they can lead to stress, that can lead to health problems, that can potentially even lead to unethical behavior when we're trying to promote individuality and, and, and materialism. Uh, when you add that to the tendency to associate wealth and whiteness as markers of success, it can certainly bend thinking toward negative biases toward people of color and people from lower income backgrounds. The good news, we have an opportunity to use self-awareness to disrupt this thinking. When we affirm students for who they are and we reshape indicators of success per student, we're promoting new thinking patterns, one where we know who we are, we believe in who we are, and we know how to manage and regulate ourselves to work toward goals, both now and goals in the future. Fostering a true sense of community decreases stress, decreases health concerns, and can decrease unethical behaviors. There's you know, an article listed there. You can read more about it in that article. Uh, it's entitled Equity and Social Emotional Learning, a Cultural Analysis. Very helpful. One aspect of self-awareness is to identify emotion. We start out with three basic emotions, mad, sad, and glad. A tool like this feelings wheel that you see there can help youth develop a robust emotional vocabulary. Now, this is a basic wheel. There are wheels that go into significantly more detail and, and many, many more emotions. This is just a great a starter emotion wheel. If you just do a Google search for a feelings wheel, you'll definitely find uh, a lot more options. One thing uh, of which to be aware when you're talking about feelings with students is that different cultures may view and manage emotions according to their cultural norms. You can take an equitable approach to this by asking youth how they perceive different emotions. You as the adult learner and leader in the room can also do some work by learning about the cultures from which your students come. Cultural scripts guide how emotion is perceived and displayed and perhaps even regulated. In some cultures, men and women display and re regulate emotion differently, just for one example. It's important to be aware when you're talking about feelings with students that different cultures may view and manage emotions according to their norms. You can take an equitable approach, again, like we said, by, by learning about these cultures. Cultures uh, that may prioritize social harmony, for example, may express negative emotion only when they're alone. A culture that prioritizes individual gain might express negative emotions while alone and in the presence of others. So there's a lot to be said for understanding where students are coming from and understanding how that plays into their daily life and particularly into their self-management. 
Continuing to talk about self-awareness, another aspect of that is recognizing students' strengths and successes. There's an activity within the Aperture platform that focuses on individual successes and strengths. Affirming individual strengths is a way that we promote equity. It values individual students. You can take that activity a step further, and you can not only recognize individual strengths, but you can recognize successes that occur in your group as a whole. Uh, this also helps to build relationships in the presence of difference. It looks at what community members have in common. As you learn students' strengths, leverage them. You may give them a job in the classroom. Maybe they share a hobby with students in your class. There's a way to leverage and promote their strengths. The picture that you see there highlights uh, sharing an individual student's strengths as well as those represented in the classroom. There's another great strategy for uh, self-awareness um, from one of our, our uh, partnership agencies, Shanyel Hinton uh, from Community Development for All People did a really nice job of explaining the I Am poem. So we're gonna watch her definition. So I did, well, on the actual, if you go to DESA and you go to the resources and everything, they'll have this template. So we did like an I am poem and it gives you like the subject starters and the scholars are able to fill in whatever they would like to fill in. So this is what we started with. And then we looked up our um, etymology. So like my name is two syllables. So I looked up the Shan and then I looked up the Yale um, and I took from those definitions what I wanted to take. And then I renamed myself according to, well, okay, Shan might mean this, but I feel like I'm more of a this type of person. So then I allowed the kids to look up their etymology by their syllables. If you go to um, Aperture, so like the site where we do our ratings for DESA, there's yeah. a resource tab. And if you hit the resource tab, it'll give you like all the, all the competencies of social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. And it will allow you to have like, they're full lesson plans. And if you just go read through them, and then by the time you like reach the end of them, it'll have the actual printouts. So I, I found this lesson plan actually on DESA and this, this was the paper provided that they actually like give to you um, through that site. So it's an I am poem. So like the kids say who they are, they say who they're related to, what they need, who they love. And then they're able to kind of share out um, and then I just extended it by exploring etymology, allowing them to take what they wanted to take from what was given to them, but also allowing them to create um, mm -hmm. as, a, as whatever they want it to be called. Um, and it was pretty cool. And we also did our names in Pig Latin that day too. So like none of us speak Pig Latin, but we thought it would be cool to learn. And so just ex exploration around your name, who you, who you are, but who you want to be called and like, how do you want that to reflect yourself? So it's a pretty fun lesson plan. All right, we're gonna continue with another strategy. We're going to look at self-management together. So self-management, you know, once you are starting to grow in self-awareness, you can learn to uh, be a good self-manager. That just means you can regulate your emotions, you can regulate your thoughts, your behaviors, uh, and you can control your impulses. You can motivate yourself. So you see some examples there uh, on the slide. You know, one, one concern with self-management when we're thinking about, you know, culture and equity and where students come from is that schools are very prone to prioritize American middle-class culture. And if a student is not from American middle-class culture, uh, you know, it could be students experiencing financial insecurity. It could be um, immigrant and refugee families. Uh, a lot of times these children experience stress due to the pressure to just assimilate. When your heritage doesn't line up with your host, it can lead to stress, it can lead to mental health disorders, it can lead to you know, challenging and dysregulated behavior. Um, discrimination can also contribute to mental health challenges and to you know, contribute to stress and contribute to dysregulated behavior. Students can experience discrimination in many areas, including race, class, and gender. So what can we do? We think about equity. 
We work to disrupt oppressive systems and we work to affirm our students. We can create cultures where we value race, class, gender, heritage, and we can teach self-management uh, tools to cope with the real stress of dic discrimination and acculturation. We can help students recognize what happens in their bodies when they're stressed. Maybe their muscles tighten, maybe their fists ball up, maybe, maybe they pace, maybe they shut down. We can help them understand these signals, which in turn can help regulate their behavior. Um, we had a student at our center, I'll share a quick story, who was struggling a lot with anger, particularly in competitive games. And so anytime in the gym, we knew that we needed to do some, some extra focus and work to help set him up for success. So we did a lot of discussion about, you know, what happens to his body when he's starting to feel angry. And he said, you know, I, I ball my fists up and I hold my breath. And I'm like, great. That's great. It's great that you recognize that. That's self-awareness. Now let's work on self-management when that happens. So, you know, we, we just kind of worked with him and he understood that, it, you know, if he felt his fist balling up or if he felt himself holding his breath, that that might mean he needed to take a break from the activity. Maybe he needed to step back. And so I remember one day he came to my office uh, with his teacher and, and you know, I, I wasn't sure why I wasn't sure what, what the reason was, but he was smiling ear to ear and he said, I did it. I did it. I did it. I balled my fist up and I removed myself from the game and I, I didn't. And, you know, manage my anger poorly. And it was just, it was such a wonderful moment. I, I love that story, just helping students, you know, realize that, you know, they're in a lot of control and that they can, you know, manage themselves effectively. So that was, that was one story there. Breathing techniques, another great self-management tool. Uh, they help us reset. They help us to think more clearly. Square breathing, as you see there on the left, is a, is a popular technique. Um, the blue circle on the square kind of helps you see where to start. And you can trace the shape with your finger or you can follow it with your eyes. And you breathe in as you count to four. You hold as you count to four. You breathe out as you count to four. You hold for four. And you repeat that process until you feel your body regulating, until you feel yourself calming down, when you feel your brain coming into a regulated state. And, you know, that's, that's an important thing to talk about with students is how to recognize when they're becoming regulated. You know, maybe their muscles are relaxing. You know, maybe their pacing is slowing down. Those balled up fists are relaxing, et cetera. Uh, on the right, you see just an, another technique. There are many. These are just two of many. But figure eight, or some people call it lazy eight breathing. Uh, again, you start in the middle, you trace the shape with your finger, your eyes, um, and when you're tracing that left side, you're breathing in, and when you're tracing the right side, you're breathing out. So just a different approach. Um, some students may need something more visual that's, that's not just a piece of paper. They might need something you know, more physical and visual. So belly breathing is one. You simply place your hands on your belly, and as you breathe in, you feel your abdomen enlarge, and it gets smaller as you breathe out. And it just helps you to focus on that breath, uh, you know, just to, to regulate a bit. And you might find that some students don't need visual aids at all. They don't need a physical, you know, activity to assist them. They just need to take deliberate breaths. So depending on their age, depending on their development, again, give each student the tools that they need in that moment um, to regulate and to be successful. A feelings journal is another example of a way that you could help students um, monitor their feelings. They can write about what's making them feel frustrated or infuriated or joyful or sad or whatever feeling word they are describing. If we habitually reflect, it helps us to learn and manage ourselves. Uh, younger students might, they might draw. Intermediate students might draw and write. Older students might write, perhaps illustrate, definitely up to the student. Again, it's giving them the tool they need in that moment to be successful. The point is that they're sort of monitoring and reflecting on those emotions. Sensory items are awesome when students benefit from that. I am a person who likes sensory items. You can ask anybody I work with. I always have something in my hand. That's just that sort of helps me focus. So something to hold like maybe Play-Doh or stress balls can be great tools. Glitter jars that you see in the middle there, they're really fun. You can, you can shake them up and watch the glitter settle. And it sort of symbolizes our emotion and helps us sort of you know, be still and regulate as we, you know, watch the glitter settle, we kind of, our, our bodies kind of regulate in that as well. Again, it's not one size fits all. You're going to find what works for each student by offering options and coaching them on the options that you're offering. 
We're going to move into social awareness. And we want to be aware that students from diverse backgrounds may experience stress as a result of the dominant culture in their schools. As the U.S. grows in diversity, we often highlight differences in, in a negative way rather than highlight what connects us and what we have in common. Again, this leads to stress. It leads to disengagement, isolation, exclusion, and all of those things impact success. It's critical that we help students build empathy. That's a key component of social awareness. You see on that slide that we're looking at, you know, the ability to just understand social and ethical norms for behavior, to recognize, you know, resources and supports that we have, to be able to build empathy, to appreciate diversity, to respect others, to learn how to take uh, the perspective of others, all contribute to our growth and development in social awareness. We want to help students you know, just understand this through discussion, through fun activities. We want to do things that promote a collaboration in the presence of difference. One way to do this is cultural sharing. You can facilitate a discussion about cultures um, from students right there in your group. You can talk, you know, whatever they want to share about culture, language, food, art, religion, celebrations, just anything that they want to share uh, that represents who they are. You know, you can, they can share as much or as little as they want. You can extend it even by having sort of a cultural show and tell, so to speak. You might even consider parent engagement at this level and have a cultural celebration where families learn from one another and celebrate culture, you know, perhaps with a, a international potluck or a fashion show that represents clothing from different, different cultures, musical demonstrations. There are a lot of things that we can do um, just to really promote and celebrate the cultures shared by those in our sphere of influence. Another way to control awareness is uh, to have a classroom agreement. This is, uh, you know, a lot of times we just think, well, we're going to set the expectation for our class. I'm going to let the children know what my expectations are, what the rules are. And, you know, it's good to have expectations in your classroom. I, I want to challenge us to think about a different way of coming to that agreement. So classroom agreements, you work on these together with students. What you do is you facilitate a discussion. You determine what do you value as a classroom community. You're going to talk about accountability. You're going to talk about how you can all work together to try to work toward these agreements uh, that you have made. And if somebody breaks the agreement, you have this physical paper, poster, whatever it is that you construct, you have it to refer them back to and help them reconcile with community. And it's just a matter of saying, you know, hey, like we made this agreement together. You know, this is something that, um, you know, we agreed to do. And so I'm going to ask that you, you know, let's reconcile. What can we do to bring you and restore you back into community um, based on our agreement? The one thing that I want to encourage you to always be aware of is, is just the things that you see, the interactions that you see. Please do not turn a blind eye and think that it will get addressed somewhere else or by somewhere else or by someone else rather. I want you to be the system disruptor. When you see someone being excluded, address it. You promote inclusion. You be the one to shut down discrimination when it happens. When you see students or colleagues experiencing stress from social pressures or discrimination or inequities or bullies, whatever it is, you be the one. You stand up and do something. I want us all to just be very mindful and intentional to create and foster safe environments. As we continue our talk about equity and social emotional competencies, we're going to turn now to relationship skills. As we are learning to be self-aware and to self-manage, and as we're growing in social awareness, we can really work intentionally on relationship skills. We understand things differently. We all have various lived experiences. These different understandings of norms regarding emotional management, age, gender, class, and all of these things can lead to friction as we can misunderstand each other's efforts to share together and to be in community together. So we wanna to work toward growth, and healthy conflict resolution. We don't simply work to get groups to follow expectations and be compliant, right? We want to get there by shared understanding and by growing together. And so relationships are an equity issue. Students need to learn to develop and cultivate healthy relationships. This is a tool just like every other SEL tool that will set students up for life. One way that you can work toward relationship skills are group projects. They're great doors for discussion. It's you know, a great opportunity to talk about collaboration regardless of the topic. It's all in how you set up expectations. So let students know the deal breakers, come up with those agreements together. You know, when we work in a group project, 
We respect each other's opinions. We listen to every group member. We give value to every group member's input, et cetera. It's, it's really on us to set them up to be successful as they work together. And if in the process, if you need to intervene and, and mediate, then do so, you know, but truly, you know, really try to let them work on this. And we can always elevate the SEL component of an activity, particularly a group activity by having a time of debriefing or reflection. You can ask questions such as, you know, how did it feel to give value to everyone? What ideas were contributed to your group that might not have been if we didn't give everybody a turn to share? Tie it back into equity, affirm individuals and give value, uh, give value to each other in the presence of difference. Teaching perspective, practicing perspective taking is another great tool to help students build uh, social awareness and relationship skills. We all need to understand that there are multiple perspectives. To think that our perspective, that our truth applies to everyone is not only wrong, it can be harmful. So if you look at the image on the left, some people might be seeing a vase. Some people may be seeing the side profiles of two faces looking at one another. Multiple perspectives. Another example on the right, do you see a face? Or do you see the side profile of someone playing the saxophone? Different perspectives. And we're just looking at concrete images right now. Think about, you know, when we look at our, our view on life and our view on our culture, our view on our relationships, there's so many perspectives. And so it's really important to help students see um, that there are multiple perspectives and we wanna be aware of that and practice taking the perspective of someone else. Using a simple tool like these optical illusions can be great introductions to those conversations. And as we continue our tour of our competencies, we're gonna turn now to responsible decision-making. You can see there are different examples. You know, decision-making is, is, is that. It's learning to make constructive choices that are based on you know, ethical standards. We wanna make safe decisions and we wanna think through consequences of our decisions as well. So it includes what you see bulleted there, identifying problems, analyzing them, evaluating them, and, and also you know, holding a high regard for ethical responsibility. We wanna promote decision-making in a way that sets up students and adults to create and contribute towards systems that disrupt inequities and that promote inclusive, mutually supportive systems. See, adults use the, the prefrontal cortex. That's the rational part of our brain. We use that to make decisions. That's fine. Rational, <laughs> again, we can do that. But up until your early 20s, young people are using the amygdala. That's the emotional center of the brain. By practicing and discussing responsible decision-making, we're putting uh, students in the position to begin strengthening that connection between their prefrontal cortexes and their amygdalas. And so until they can fully use that rational part, we can do a lot by helping them practice connection between their amygdala and their prefrontal cortex. There are ways to do this. We can do this through community building and we can, um, you know, sometimes we can do this through making decisions together. Class meetings are really great opportunities for community building and they provide opportunity for decision making. So there you have listed, you know, four kind of typical components of a, of a good class meeting. Um, the greeting, I really want to emphasize here, it's important for students to know one another's names. And it's important for the adult leader and learner in the room to know everybody's name in the room. Also, it's really important to know how to say names correctly. This may take time and it may take practice and you may mess up several times, but be open to being corrected and be intentional about, you know, just reiterating, am I saying your name correctly until you have it down? Super, super important to understand somebody's name and how to say it correctly. Another component is engaged sharing. It just means that you, you can have a check-in, you know, how are you feeling today? You might have a question of the day, but it's something that, you know, you're prompting discussion and they're, you know, engaged in, in sharing their examples. They're also making a decision here, you know, what am I willing to share? What am I not willing to share? So it, it is stimulating their decision-making a bit in that process. Then you can move to an SEL promoting activity. Uh, this can be tied to academics, it can be a movement activity, an enrichment activity, sometimes it can encompass all of those things. One, one simple example within this class meeting strategy, uh, you know, we'll give a math example. You may give students cards that you've made uh, or that you've printed from the internet or whatever that have fractions on them. And they have to get up and find a student with a fraction equivalent to theirs. Well, clearly this promotes math. We're working on equivalent fractions. It also supports movement. 
which is really important to have in your day. It helps us kind of stay focused and stimulated. And it also fosters discussion and a sense of shared purpose. So it's a great way to incorporate SEL and academics together. And then the message for the day is kind of a preview for today. It's, you know, what are we doing today? Um, so this is kind of an example of a class meeting that you would have on a daily basis. You can also call class meetings when you need to. They're great to use for problem solving. So if there's a community problem, the community comes around it, they discuss it, and then work toward the resolution. So again, hitting multiple SEO competencies there, you're working on you know, awareness, management, you're working on relationship skills, social awareness, and there's some decision making involved in that as well. One of my favorite decision making strategies, it's a really quick one, but it can be a very profound one, are would you rather questions. And you may have heard these there. Some of them are very simple, right? Would you rather eat breakfast in the morning for breakfast or would you rather have breakfast for dinner? Very simple questions. Would you rather have super strength or super speed? And these questions are really great and they, you know, they prompt students to, to think through a decision. They have to decide on an answer and the key is to ask them why. Why did you make the decision that you did? Why would you rather have super strength or why would you rather have super speed? There, that that th gets them to thinking about the consequence of the decision they're making. And so we're stimulating that part of their brain and helping them think through. We're also encouraging perspective taking, right? How will it impact people, um, the, the decision that you've made? How will that impact people? You can even take it deeper and ask some pretty serious questions. Um, one that I recently asked with students at our center was, you know, if you had the power, would you rather end hatred or poverty? The reflection again comes in the why. Why are you choosing that one? Why would you rather end hatred or why would you rather end poverty? And it just, you can facilitate really great discussions here, really deep, rich discussions. You know, just emphasize the importance of the decision, emphasize building empathy, and just thinking through the impact of those decisions. Great, great way to, to work on decision making. Next, we're going to move into goal directed behavior. So, setting goals helps us to think beyond the present moment, right? As we look, you know, at things through, through uh, promoting equity, it's important to remember that some people are fighting for today. So setting goals way out in the future might be a new concept or it might be one that they're wrestling with a bit because they're literally just trying to get through today. Goals don't have to be months or years away. Goals can totally be about today. Goals can be about the morning or the afternoon. Break it down into what works for each student. That's how you make goal setting equitable. If I'm learning maybe to self-manage, my goal today might simply be to let my teacher know when I kind of feel my zone of regulation changing, like I, I'm, I'm not feeling great or I'm starting to feel overwhelmed or I'm starting to feel stressed or pressured. Um, you know, that, that could be a goal. Another goal may be, you know, today I am going to listen when it's someone else's turn to talk. That's great. That's a great goal to work toward. And it's something that we work can work on today. All goals have importance. Equity, again, is encouraging each student where they are and setting goals that are relevant to that student. Also, I really want to encourage you to allow student voice. They should be the driving force behind their goals. Even if you have a specific goal in mind for the student, you can ask questions to aid their goal setting process. Let them speak. Ask students what's important to them. And please don't limit goals to academics. Goals can be in any area in which we want to grow. It could be sports. It could be nutrition, art language. It could be a better way to contribute to my household. It could be my screen time. And I might be setting goals for the future for a year from now or, or five years from now or when I grow up, etc. Smart goals is, is probably a concept that you've at least heard of, you might be familiar with. Uh, I'm going to go through it briefly just in case this is your first time hearing about SMART goals. Uh, the, the acronym stands for something. So the S stands for specific. So we wanna avoid generalities. We wanna help students take a goal such as, I wanna be a good student and make it more specific, like the student's example here, I wanna finish my work on time. The M stands for measurable. How will you know you've reached the goal? Is it something that we can measure? So for this student, I, I either did my work on time or I did it. So yes, it's measurable. The A is for achievable. Some, some might also use attainable for the A. Are there smaller steps to take to work toward the goal? So an example is if I have a goal to run a marathon, but I'm not really a runner, I'm probably gonna start with steps, right? I'm gonna have realistic steps to work toward this goal. I might start with running a mile and then a 5K and work, you know, work my way from there. The R stands for realistic. Is this a realistic goal? Does it make sense? Is it something that can be accomplished within the time frame that I'm looking at here? 
And lastly, the T stands for timely. Time targets just help us to focus. So for ongoing goals, we, we might keep resetting the time and say, okay, for the next month, I'm still gonna work on this. For the next month, I'm still working. In this example, the student might set daily goals, maybe weekly goals to continue finishing work on time, or perhaps just until it's a really solid habit. And then the student may set and work toward a new goal. Another way to talk about goal setting are to share relevant goal setting stories from people who we can relate to, people who are familiar to us in some sense, uh, so here's some just some examples. There are hundreds of stories to choose from. Here are just some examples. Barack Obama in fourth grade set a goal to become president. Michael Jordan set a goal to start on the varsity team at his school. Thomas Edison, who was told he would never amount to anything, had a goal to be an inventor. And I just have two words to mention here. Light bulb, along with many other things that he invented. Serena Williams, when she was asked as a child which tennis player she aspired to be like, she paused and then she said, mm, I want other people to be like me. She was 11 when she said that and had that goal in mind. Malala pursued an education. J.K. Rowling wanted to be a writer. All people who set goals who, you know, we may be familiar with and we can per perhaps aspire to have a goal in our life like they had a goal in their lives. You might also ask students about people in their circles who have set and worked toward goals. They may have really great stories about siblings or parents or aunts, uncles, whoever, that they can share uh, about goals that they have achieved. That can turn into a time of sharing. It can be a time of writing. You could, you know, have art to support this. You can have them practice public speaking. Lot, lots of fun things that this can turn into. Now we're going to look at personal responsibility. So we're still moving through these SEL competencies as we look through ways to promote equity within them. So personal responsibility is simply, you know, being careful with your actions, to be a reliable person and to be a contributing member of your group. So to do that, we have to do things like understand expectations. We want to be able to be on task. We want to be dependable and helpful and even serve as role models for our peers. So I want you to remember that equity is when we level the playing field. It means we give each student the tools they need for where they are and, and when we're working together. If we wanna teach students to be personally responsible, we need to define expectations. Kids are not mind readers. I've seen many leaders discipline students for not meeting expectations that were never set. We need to set expectations. And again, those classroom agreements could help us do that. So we need to set expectations and then we need to equip students to meet them. And we're gonna do this over and over until it becomes habit. This is our job, this is a lot of our role. So we're gonna discern what students are, are good at. What are their strengths? We're gonna observe them, we're gonna ask them, and then we're gonna leverage those strengths. What do they enjoy? When are they happiest? So for example, if you have a student who loves to write, wonderful, maybe they become your historian for the class who documents classroom moments and memories and things that you want to, to have later. Do you have a student who loves to take pictures? Oh, you found your class photographer. The student who maybe has a lot of energy and, and bumps into furniture and rearranges it. Well, great, maybe they're having, your, or helping rather with activity preparation where you need to move furniture and move around. Build on a student's strengths, help them see their strengths even if they don't. What do students need to stay on task? Staying on task is another part of personal responsibility. And again, it's not about everyone having the same thing. It's about each student having what that student needs. Some students may need a peer to help them. They might need a buddy to help them stay on task and to be accountable. Other students maybe need timers. Some students benefit from flexible seating, others do not. Some students like checklists, others are irritated by them. Ask your students and help them see what they need to stay on task and to be responsible. It's all about communication. I have a student in our center who needs movement breaks in order to stay on task. Virtual school right now is the world that we're in and it's hard. And about every 20, 25 minutes or so, he, he needs a five to 10 minute break. But doing this helps him stay on task. Um, we found that this is a really successful strategy for him. He's the only one in the class who does this. The other students know that it helps him and they support it. We have another student who's consistently concerned about time and transition. And so he has a little individual visual timer that we set for him. Again, he's the only one that has one. He needs that, you know, to help him be successful. It helps him sort of be responsible with the way that he's working and it helps him understand what's, what's coming. 
equity is providing students with tools that they need for that time and teaching them how to use those tools to be personally responsible. Optimistic thinking is another wonderful strategy. It's another wonderful competency rather in, in, in social emotional learning. Teaching optimism, super important. You can see there that optimism is just the, you know, having an attitude of confidence, being hopeful, thinking positively toward situations, whether they were in the past, whether they're happening now, or whether there's something to come. Uh, it's also believing in the ability to achieve future goals. So that kind of reverts back to that goal setting strategy. You know, we're looking back there and we're thinking optimistically that we can work toward the goals that we have set as well as other things. Psychology Today notes that pessimism is actually linked to higher risk for depression, along with anxiety, sleep disorders, heart disease, just to name a few. If we want to be system disruptors and disrupt those systems that place our students at risk, one way to do that is to teach optimism. And we want to note here that optimism can be taught. You don't have to be born to be and be wired to think optimistically. It is actually a skill we can practice and learn. Realistic optimism, uh, read about this on an article at Edutopia, but it, it's, it talks about learned helplessness, which is basically the thought that we don't really have control what happens to us. And, and with that in mind, we kind of stop trying. We, we lose motivation and we become very passive. Optimism is a tool to fight that. We can fight learned helpless, helplessness with optimism and we can reframe thinking. We can help students reframe events in a positive way. So maybe they lost the basketball game, but we can focus on the fact that they still in practice or they still practiced important skills that will help prepare them for the future. Gratitude is another really helpful practice. Even on the very worst days, we are still in uh, control of our attitudes. We can cultivate gratitude. You've probably heard that pausing each day to name three things for which you are thankful can help to form new neuropathways in your brains. It actually helps to reframe the way we look at things. So attitude can, uh, an attitude of gratitude rather, can lend itself toward optimistic thinking. You might consider having a gratitude wall in your classroom, a place where you're posting things for which you're thankful. Um, recently at our center, we had a gratitude tree. Here are a couple of examples of that. And it's sort of a continual working display. As students think about things for which they're thankful, they simply just add it to the tree. And before you know it, your tree is so full <laughs> that you may need a second or you may need to prune it a bit to make room for more gratitude. But it's really, really good pra uh, practice just to keep gratitude in mind. When it comes to optimistic thinking and really all social emotional competencies, model it. It's so important to be a role model. Speak positively. Take a negative event and frame it positively at every chance you can. When we found ourselves in a pandemic, it would have been really easy for that learned helplessness to kick in, right? Because we were not in control of really a lot of things. So, you know, it, it, at our center, we had to resolve to speak positively and I had to model this. And so we set a rule on our team. We were not allowed to operate in the mindset that we can't do particular activities anymore. We weren't allowed to say we can't. Instead, we had to find a way to say that and to do that differently. So one example is we couldn't have our normal all program kind of pep rally in the morning during our summer program because of social distancing and group capacity requirements. So instead, we all jumped on a Zoom call and every classroom still participated. So we couldn't say like, well, we can't do this anymore. We just have to find a way to do it differently. That was one way to model optimistic thinking and to reframe something to be positive. That's just one way out of thousands of examples that, that I'm sure we can all think of. So you can serve as a role model, both to peers and absolutely to the youth in your sphere of influence, practice modeling optimism, build those neuropathways that support this type of thinking. And this, it just, it comes from practice. The more we practice, the stronger we become in this. I love this quote that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that's uh, spoken and attributed to Nelson Mandela. Please prioritize equity in everything that you do. It's our job as adults to give our students the tools they need where they are. The way we lead has impact. Let's do all we can to impact change and to equip students with tools that will help them for the rest of our lives. I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, some references used in this training. 
Other references were, were noted on the slides. Some of the competency information came from the article that you see there. Also want to point you to partnershipforsuccess.org. We have a lot of great articles and resources and more trainings on the website that are you know, free and accessible to you, and we offer you to explore those. Thank you so much for listening to this training. I hope that you found it to be helpful, and I, I hope that you uh, continue with me in this journey to practice mindfulness in, in promoting equity in all that we do with our youth. Take care.